we're on. Let's learn about tax disputes today. Um, if you've tuned in, thank you very much. If you're in the audience, we really appreciate you taking up your time. And if you're watching the recording, you're in for a treat. Uh, my name is Gary Kasudu. And um, today I'm an observer of uh, a world I know nothing about, actually. And I'm really excited. I've got my notepad ready. If you, are, if you work in the world of accounting, you are going to get a lot of value from here. So uh, the, the, really the founder of Tax Resolute introduced herself and tell us uh, why do you do this and, and, and a big thank you to you for putting this on. Over to you, Jasmina. Thank you, Gary, for that introduction. Um, as you all know, my name is Jasmine and I'm a tax investigation or tax dispute expert and I have over 22 years of experience in this area. Um, the reason why I do these webinars is because I like to share my expertise and experience in order for um, the taxpayer and agents out there to put uh, knit things in the bud so it doesn't have to roll over and develop to get to where I am at the moment, where I have to then unknot a very complicated um, dispute that may have been um, handled right at the beginning if certain actions had taken place. So um, I've actually uh, discussed one of the topics that has been um, that has uh, has been requested is um, about tribunal proceedings, and this is why I've invited Julian along. Um, in order to help me with this webinar and co-present. So over to you, Julian, if you would like to introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Julian Hickey. I am a tax barrister, uh, also with uh, just over 20 years experience uh, in a mixture of uh, advisory and uh, litigation work. I've been back at the tax bar for the last 10 years and my practice is 95% litigious. So. I cover all of the principal taxes and also some of the more esoteric ones, such as advanced petroleum revenue tax, which you've probably never heard of and don't need to uh, hear anything about uh, today. So I cover everything under the sun uh, relating to litigation arising out of tax, and that's both in the civil courts, judicial review and aspects touching on criminal prosecution. If you're in the audience right now or you're watching us live, you can ask questions. We, we, we encourage it. You can change the direction of the, of the webinar and um, that's the best way of getting things out of it. So over to you to kick this off. Um, uh, first of all, uh, let's put the first poll up as an icebreaker because especially with the spring tax um, statement yesterday and uh, it'd be interesting to see... Guys, you can um, push the poll to one side as well. Um, but I thought because of all the changes that has taken place, or rather maybe not to that extent, um, uh, it ha may have had a great impact or not had a great impact. Um, sorry for my very cynical, like, yes, he knows how to pander to the public or he d adds no value. But I thought it'd be interesting to see what the reaction is because um, I will definitely be mentioning it tomorrow on my LinkedIn um, and posting more about it tomorrow. So um, it'd be great if you could uh, answer that poll. Um, if in a few minutes, then we can go on to the second one, just so I know the makeup of our audience in um, do you deal with tax di disputes and have you attended tribunal hearings? So we understand how um, we've added value um, and, and so we can do better next time. Um, but now what we'll do is we'll start the, I'll share the screen and we'll start the presentation. Um, but we are, I'll, I want it more to be more of a discussion between me and Julian. So um, Julian, feel free um, to, to jump in anytime you would like, um, if you feel that um, you can clarify something further. So can everyone see um, the screen, how to make a tribunal feel appealing? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, that's great. Okay, so um, we've got a very nice photo of Julian there, um, and we've already introduced ourselves. So today um, we're going to be going over the overall tribunal processes and the tribunal categories, and also you'll see us pepper our experiences all throughout the PowerPoint slides as well and also share our experience and what happens on the day. And what I wanted to do is just at least give everyone an outline of what happens from the point where 
you have the decision letter, you have a letter from HMRC um, all the way to the actual hearing on the day and even what happens afterwards and what's the process afterwards. So you go to first tier tax tribunal, what the structure is. And what I'm hoping is that everyone walks away with a good idea of what should be happening and when. Um, one of the main reasons is, is I still come across people who um, has gone through the tribunal process um, and are just before the tribunal, they, they, they could have managed things in a more better way had they had known about the processes. So even though you may not be um, presenting the hearing yourself, or you may be, um, at least the agent or the taxpayer should be able to say, oh, I know this is meant to happen and this is meant to happen, we meant, meant, meant to do it this way and this. So you may not have the technical expertise, but at least you'll have a very good idea how it should be um, processed, how what procedures you should be following. So um, who is your opponent? Um, it's HMRC. Uh, normally, and uh, you'll have the HMRC inspector who or the caseworker present at the hearing. You have an HMRC tribunal caseworker um, in the dispute resolution area. And uh, they can be um, HO caseworkers, um, normally of the same level as a caseworker, which a lot of people do not realize. When it comes to more complicated um, uh, tax disputes, then you'll have like the um, solicitors and barristers and QCs engaged. But when it's uh, more, less complicated and more of a first tier tax tribunal, you will have um, tribunal caseworkers more or less at the level of the caseworker who actually um, conducted the casework and made that decision, uh, which a lot of people doesn't know. So it's simply because it's headed by um, HMRC, uh, HM uh, solicitor's office doesn't mean um, you're actually dealing with a barrister or sol solicitor and you'll find that especially with reasonable excuses as well um, that the decision has been made by the solicitor's office um, but actually it's the caseworker but when it's more complicated um, it's a good idea to see okay what what kind of um, opponent are we going to be against so if you know there's a solicitor and um, or a barrister you definitely know you don't want someone who's an accountant or who hasn't been qualified um, or called to the bar. Uh, you want need, need someone who has a le legal technical expertise. Okay, so what? this is Julian's quote. Yes, this is Ambrose Bierce, uh, the author of uh, uh, something called The Devil's Dictionary in the early part of the 19th century. So. The reason for the uh, quote, uh, lawsuit, uh, a machine you, which you go into as a pig and come out as a sausage, it really, uh, to be quite frank, uh, sums up the potential problem with litigation. And the problem with litigation is if you don't prepare, that is the effect which is going to happen on your case. And the key point about litigation is preparation, preparation, preparation. And there's another quote uh, I like using, which we don't have on the slides, and it's uh, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, which is his known knowns and known unknowns. So, of course, in litigation, we've got known knowns, which is what is the dispute about. We'll know that because we'll have received a decision letter and you will have worked on the tax inquiry uh, for, uh, let's say, a number of years. So we have known knowns, but we've also got known unknowns if we're going to go into a tribunal hearing. And frankly, whilst uh, our clients may uh, come across very well uh, in a meeting room, it's a very different matter when you put an individual in the witness box, they're cross-examined, they're put under pressure, it's not a natural environment for anyone, they will become anxious. So you've got no idea what impact that environment will have on the individual and how the judge is going to assess their credibility and at the point of the first tier tribunal it's a very important tribunal in many respects because the judge makes findings of fact and will draw inferences and conclusions based on their assessment of the witness uh, then we've got unknown unknowns 
uh, in litigation, uh, which is with litigation, you can't be prepared enough. And the reason I say that is something might be disclosed at the last minute, someone might say something and say, oh, hang on a minute, uh, there's something which exists which is of relevance to these proceedings, uh, that potentially sets the hair running, it may or not be relevant to the issues. And again, it all comes down to, uh, I suppose, my one takeaway message for anyone uh, contemplating going into a tax tribunal, anyone thinking about uh, representing client in the FTT is always be prepared. You need to prepare for the hearing, you need to read the papers, you need to know the law, and you need to know the facts, and you need to know them inside out. So that's the reason I got that quote. And I, I second that because I have been in hearings and it seemed to be going well. Not, I'm, not that I'm saying you can predict the outcome, you can't. Um, and, but you do feel a change when something's been said and, and it's just spun on that statement. You can see a complete difference um, that the, the case has definitely done a U-turn because of one statement that's been made maybe by the appellant on the stand or maybe or, or another witness. And I, I've definitely seen, seen that take place. I couldn't agree with you more in respect of that. Um, okay. So if we start the whole process, first of all, you need to ensure that you have a decision in place. And um, that might sound a bit odd, but there has been cases where um, the client thought there was a decision that had been issued, but actually it was a letter. Um, and HMRC thought it was an informal letter and they never saw it as a formal decision against which um, which could be appealed. So that's the first step to make sure that an actual decision has been issued so that you have the right of appeal. Um, so you need to ensure that either the assessment has been issued and there's always some um, instructions at the end of it to say you've got 30 days uh, to make an appeal. But on the other hand, sometimes um, in some like fat decisions that have been issued, the, there's supposed to be an attachment saying you've got 30 days. And I, I have actually represented clients where that was never attached. So our client was never actually notified of the 30 days um, rule uh, for the time limit in order to submit an appeal. Um, if you have a situation where uh, um, the decision or the assessment may have been received by the client or the taxpayer, but uh, um, it's late, it's well outside the 30 days because for whatever reason they didn't realise they had an appeal, uh, appealable matter, then the next step uh, in regards to that is to submit a late appeal um, as soon as possible. Now, I haven't gone too much into this because uh, I've written quite a lot on this uh, and uh, we could actually do probably a whole day, uh, um, whole, whole day presentation on reasonable appeals, in, if not longer. Um, and so I've just kept it narrow because the whole point of today's presentation is to go through the whole a process from start to end for the tribunal process. I'm not sure if you're aware, but a third of the audience haven't uh, had to deal with the tax disputes. 67% okay. already have. So I'll just so you okay. know. So this is, um, this is quite uh, useful because you, first of all, you need to know that whatever has been issued, if there's a decision and an assessment, that you know it's an appealable matter. And normally there will be instructions there to say you have 30 days uh, within within 30 days to make a, um, an appeal. Um, sometimes if, it's, if there's nothing attached to it and so on, then that is another issue because that means that you haven't been notified that you've got 30 days to make the appeal, but you'd have to evidence that as well. So that if you realise outside the 30 days, and I'm sure a lot of us have come in across in this um, situation, which again, I could probably do a whole day on it, uh, when the company has gone into liquidation and an assessment's been issued in the director's name uh, personally uh, based on the company assessments, but the liquidator won't handle it because it's not relevant to him. The accountant thinks it's what I call the Bermuda Triangle. The accountant thinks the liquidator is handling it all, but they're not. And the director is told to ignore it. So you have a situation where 
Um, there is an appealable matter, but they've been told that it's been handled by whoever, or, or they've wrongly assumed the liquidator will do um, will. Uh, um, submit an appeal on their behalf, and the liquidator won't, especially if there's no um, uh, if there's no assets involved as a result. So you have that kind of situation for an out of appeal, and for that you would need to. Um, if we go to the next slide, Ooh. okay, a reasonable excuse, uh, and so you would need to you need to demonstrate why. Um, why was there a delay? Uh, what was the reasons and for how long for? In that, as soon as you realize that the it, it had to be submitted um, as soon as possible, there mustn't be any delay from that. Otherwise, you have to explain. So I had one accountant who actually um, delayed by another further three months because he thought he had to formulate the accounts in order to present that as part of the appealable matter but he didn't he didn't that did not need to be the grounds of appeal he just needed to say that he felt the assessment issued by hmrc was excessive and unreasonable um he didn't need to do all of that work first and do the, all the analysis to show that the figures were incorrect in the first place um in order to submit the appeal so there was another three months of delay that had to be justified to um, the tribunal. Uh, and that would be actually Shane De Silva's case, which um, Julian is representing our client on. So in all three of those cases that we've been um, involved with, um, Rashid, Shane De Silva, you know, initiative, uh, they've actually all um, appeals that have been uh, um, submitted out of time. So the Rashid case was actually very successful. That was also a liquidation issue where um, the, our client stated he didn't receive the actual um, assessment. You know, initiative, that one also was where um, the uh, the guidance on that you have to appeal within 30 days was not actually attached to the initial letter. So there's different technical aspects to it all. But um, at the end of the day, you know, you have to provide a reasonable excuse for all of them. And there's no legal definition. Uh, and it's continuously interpreted um, in case law. So here, reasonable excuse is regarded as having the same meaning as absence, sickness, or other reasonable cause. Um, and so the reasonable excuse has to be personal to the appellant, so a late appeal should not be agreed, where, for instance, new decision of the courts, um, unconnected to the instant case, has made an appeal more viable. Julian, could you explain that bit? Yeah, this is uh, taken from the uh, HMRC's Revenue Appeals Handbook. And uh, as you were saying, Jasmine, uh, generally it's the case for all uh, appeals against principal taxes. You have to make an appeal within uh, 30 days. If you're outside that uh, day count, uh, then it's only possible to engage the appeal jurisdiction of the first tier tribunal. If either you uh, have spoke a uh, right to and obtain the agreement of HMRC and they agree uh, that you've got a reasonable excuse. And you can see uh, from what's set out there on the slide, it's an incredibly narrow view as to uh, what is a reasonable excuse. So probably eight, nine times out of 10, uh, most people have to apply to the first tier tribunal for permission to appeal out of time and on the notice of appeal form, the T240, uh, there is a box there you can tick and say, yes, my appeal is out of time and you uh, give your reasons. But of course, in those circumstances, uh, you're then asking someone else to the judge to exercise their discretion. And as you were saying, Jesmond, uh, it's that marked and up tribunal criteria. Uh, it's asking three questions. First, mm -hmm. what is uh, the length of the day? Second, what is the reason uh, for the delay and third, uh, looking at everything in its wider context, is there anything else which can be said about the merits? And like you, Jasmine, I've actually had a case where the point's been taken, where before my involvement in the case, uh, an appeal hadn't been made, uh, but it was only seven to 10 days late and the point was taken uh that uh, you shouldn't be allowed to bring the appeal out of time so then roll forward over a three-month period of 
making written submissions to the first tier tribunal and we eventually managed to engage the jurisdiction of the tribunal so if you're in that situation advising a client do you make sure that application goes in because it's so difficult engaging the jurisdiction after the event it, it is for you know initiative and um and uh, the Rashid's case, it was actually about 22 months late, 22 yeah. to 28 months late. Um, and there'd have to be very good technical grounds um, with evidence. So it's not enough for all evidence uh, for the witness just to say, we didn't know, we handed it over, that it has to be more robust. Um, I'm quite keenly aware that we could talk about this area quite a lot. And so if anyone wants us to do another webinar in the future on re reasonable excuse to let us know. Um, so if we go on to... Your timing was perfect. Your timing was perfect because that was what the audience were asking. I think you've covered everything. Are you ready for your next poll? Yes. Okay. Have you attended, is it, have you attended tribunal hearings? Just so we know the proportion of um, our audience, the experience. Oh, okay. <laughs> Apologies about that. I don't know if you heard. But everything's linked up. Oh, hang on. Um, okay. So, Julian, if you could go over the overview of the tax lit litigation. Yeah. So, if we can uh, see from the slide, uh, you've got an overview of the different courts involved in uh, tax disputes and where we all get involved effectively in a tax dispute initially is through uh, the tax investigation, uh, revenue open the inquiry, carry out an investigation, and obviously if there's an adverse uh, decision against the client, uh, that results in a dispute. On the far left-hand side of the screen, we've got criminal appeals. So it's possible during the course of a civil investigation that uh, HMRC spot a point where they are seriously concerned that a client has cheated the public revenue or committed fraud by what's called false representation in relation to what they have said in their returns or accounts. In those circumstances, a criminal investigation will be opened up by a separate and independent team within HMRC. And very often, the first thing an individual business will know that they're subject to a criminal investigation is when the doorbell rings at seven o'clock in the morning and a search and seizure warrant is being served on them and uh, their premises are being searched. Now, at that point, uh, the individual's arrested and interviewed under caution at the local uh, police station. Now, assuming matters uh, progress to a criminal prosecution uh, after the revenue have completed a report, the Crown Prosecution Service then determines whether or not there should be a prosecution for a revenue offence. And if so, uh, you go up on the left-hand side of the screen, effectively, uh, to the magistrate's court initially. Uh, offences involving tax fraud are effectively tribal and what's called, uh, I, it's an either way uh, offence, but usually that results in it being then transferred to the Crown Court, trial by jury, uh, and then uh, assuming that's gone the wrong way, uh, potentially looking at an appeal then to the Court of Appeal on a point of law and then possibly up to the Supreme Court. So that's criminal appeals. Uh, then on the far right, that's really what our focus is uh, today, civil uh, appeals, so an appeal against a revenue assessment of closure notice. So what's that going to involve? Well, most uh, appeals are capable of being made on a statutory basis, and it's the first tier tribunal uh, which is given jurisdiction to hear appeals, and that usually comprises a, well, it will comprise at the very least a legally qualified judge, and possibly also uh, an individual called a member uh, who would typically have a, an accounting uh, background. Now, the FTT, as you can see, it's the lowest tribunal in the hierarchy of our tax appeal system. And despite the fact that it's the lowest in terms of hierarchy, it's actually the most important. And the reason it's the most important is it's the judge who makes findings of fact in relation to what happened for the relevant period. So what transactions occurred, what type of money, were in and out of bank accounts, uh, 
what an individual said. Uh, all of those findings of fact are made by the first tier tribunal judge, and it's that judge who assesses and draws conclusions uh, from what the witness uh, says under cross-examination uh, during the course of a hearing. And obviously, that type of uh, uh, conclusion is very important in the context of uh, penalty uh, proceedings in particular uh, from the perspective of an individual. And the reason I say it's the most important, because of the, the judge making those findings of fact, is because whichever way the decision goes at the end of the day, you can only appeal from a first-tier tribunal decision if there is an error of law to the upper tribunal. And an error of law is either where the judge has uh, made a mistake as to what the law says in statute, uh, has misunderstood, misapplied the relevant case law precedent, uh, or uh, has drawn a conclusion which no judge properly instructed on the law could have reached in relation to the documents or what the witness has said. That latter challenge is effectively regarded as a what's called an Edwards and Bairstow challenge, uh, which is a reference to the particular House of Lords case. So any appeal to the upper tribunal, you want it really to be on a, a pure error of law. The judge has got the statute, statutory interpretation wrong, misunderstood, misapplied the case law. If it's that Edwards and Bairstow challenge, it's very difficult to uh, get a winnable uh, case into the upper tribunal on that basis. The reason simply being that the first tier tribunal judge is the judge who will have assessed the evidence over often quite a considerable period of time, has evaluated it, and the judge will be given quite a wide degree of latitude as to what conclusion they can reach in terms of that assessment. So that's the FTT and that's why it's so important. Uh, in terms of the upper tribunal, as I said, uh, er his appeals on the basis of error of law, uh, that uh, uh, tribunal comprises typically either two upper tribunal uh, judges or a high court judge, uh, probably a judge who sits in the chancery division uh, and uh, an upper tribunal judge. And again, uh, the upper tribunal uh, appeal tends to be uh, last about uh, one day, uh, depending on uh, the, the results. Again, you can only appeal on error of law uh, to the court of appeal, uh, and that's quite a uh, limited scope of, in terms of the threshold criteria uh, for getting into the court of appeal. If you are into the court of appeal, that's three judges. Typically, you don't have a tax background by way of uh, their practice experience and then ultimately uh, you can have an appeal up into the Supreme Court. Uh, just to deal very briefly with uh, the middle uh, column uh, which has JR at the bottom, that's judicial review. So as I said, all the principal taxes tend to have a statutory route of appeal and that uh, engages the jurisdiction of the first tier tribunal. Uh, judicial review is concerned with uh, the exercise of discretion by HMRC. So, for example, the discretion to issue accelerated payment notices, discretion to issue follower notices. Uh, if the uh, revenue have set out a statement in their manuals, uh, which obviously you can access online, and your client relies on a statement in those manuals, which is un unambiguous, and they rely on it to their detriment because the revenue suddenly, uh, uh, or suddenly subsequently, uh, reverse their position and say, no, your client can't rely on that statement. Then you can go to the High Court Queen's Bench Division, uh, the Administrative Court, and ask the court to review the basis on which the revenue have exercised their discretion. Judicial review proceedings, uh, are subject to the general civil procedure uh, code and uh, those do tend to be very expensive proceedings because the litigation is what's called effectively uh, front-ended. Uh, you have to apply uh, effectively on the papers for permission to appeal the judicial review with all the associated witness statements and exhibits uh, used to justify that application. But uh, we'll, we'll come on to what you need to do to prepare for an FTT hearing in a moment. Um, and this 
Um, and this is the, um, the route, the pathway that we're mainly concerned with um, because, uh, as Julian stated, the first tier tax tribunal is the most important part when it comes to uh, civil litigation um, uh, from what we've seen before. the What we were seeing before was the criminal um, element of it where we do have um, a COP9 or COP8 investigation and uh, it, it would be made very clear that there is a risk of court prosecution so it would be very clear in all of the um, correspondence that you are dealing with a, a, a criminal case. Um, the civil uh, appeal, that side of things, that would be quite clear. Um, there would be an actual decision, an assessment uh, saying that you need to pay this amount and you've got 30 days to appeal uh, if you disagree. So that's the first um, part. And then we have uh, a choice of going for a statutory review or alternative dispute resolution, which is a mediation uh, between HMRC and uh, the, the client or the taxpayer in order to reach a, a resolution by agreement. Um, if that doesn't work, then it will be the appeal to the first tier tax tribunal and upper tax tribunal. As, and as Julian has um, stated quite clearly, it, it's very narrow grounds that you can go uh, to, uh, and apply for the upper, uh, upper tribunal because it's got to be on an error of law. Uh, if if uh, if even at that time, if the appeal is not up, upheld, then it will go to Court of Appeal and Supreme Court. So we've actually got one case going to Court of Appeal at the moment, which is which Julian is handling and representing our client for us. Um, then uh, it goes to Supre Supreme Court and reference to Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, so, I mean, one thing I am interested in, in is uh, how does Brexit impact the, the legislation, the tax legislation? Yeah, the, uh, just the short answer uh, to that is that uh, obviously Brexit occurred on 31st of December uh, 2020. Uh, and the effect of that is if there were referrals prior to uh, Brexit dates, then they will continue to be dealt with uh, by the European Court of Justice uh, post uh, Brexit. So, the 1st of January uh, 2021, uh, we're in a brand new uh, environment uh, courtesy of the European Union Withdrawal Act uh, 2018. Uh, decisions of the European Court uh, will still remain relevant, uh, particularly in the context of VAT because obviously whilst we have uh, our domestic legislation, the Value Added Tax Act 1994, and we will apply uh, our existing precedent system, up tribunal, court of appeals, Supreme Court cases, uh, of course, uh, where relevant, uh, either party is going to seek to refer to decisions of the European Court. Uh, on a persuasive basis uh, and, and, and seek to persuade uh, the courts in England and Wales uh, as the applicable principles to apply in that context. So obviously Brexit has had uh, an impact uh, and ultimately uh, the final uh, appeal court now is the Supreme Court. Okay, so um, um, basically still going according to the Court of Justice of the European Union if there's no referral um, no re references to the changes since then. Is that? Yeah. Is that so, so, so if the referral was made prior to Brexit, so okay. it's already in the system, uh, right. okay. then the European Court will still have a role to play. But post mm. 1st of January, uh, as it, mm. strictly, it's going to have a very limited role. But of course, everyone's going to still be interested in the cases where they're interpreting the European Directive would that be an area that we could explore, especially if we were um, going, um, uh, if, if we think that it needs to be argued further uh, on, on the basis of justice? So would that be like a grey area that still needs to be hammered out as such? Uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily an area that needs to be hammered out. The, the Withdrawal Act is quite clear as to what 
the dividing line is. Mm. But uh, where you've got subsequent decisions of the European Court on that, on the principal VAT directive, where so much of English law has effectively enshrined those principles, then European law is going to have a persuasive role, although not a binding role. Okay. Well, I was just interested to hear what the impact of that would be. So um, how do we, how do I start the appeal proceedings for uh, first year tax tribunal? The VAT, on that side, you'd issue a notice of appeal to FTT on direct tax, as in income tax and corporation tax. Um, you actually would send the appeal direct to HMRC um, and HMRC would accept it. And then if you reached an agreement or not reached an agreement, then you notify FTA um, tax tribunal. And there does seem to be like a confusion as well on this point, because if um, you've applied out for 30 days, even though you have notified HMRC, HM, uh, the FTT will ask, why have you notified us out of 30, uh, outside the 30 days? Um, because they will take it strictly from the date of the assessment, even though you have, or the decision later, even though you've notified HMRC. So um, just be aware of that. Not that it will be rejected because it's all already been accepted as an appeal by HMRC on direct tax side. So there will be details. And again, I, I have written quite extensively about this um, as well on, on LinkedIn. Uh, in regards to what needs to go to the notice of the of appeal, um, there would be a format to follow, uh, and um, it's quite a very easy process in regards to uh, the actual form. You go online, uh, there's an online form, and you just complete your details, and you can submit it online, and then um, you get an ac acknowledgement email. Although I've had some scary moments where the acknowledgement email hadn't come in and then it became apparent that um, something had gone wrong with FTT's inbox. Um, but Julian suggested we can just save it as a PDF and send it off to uh, um, the uh, tax tribunal's um, inbox and that should be fine because you, you can prove that you've sent it. Um, so we, the first document we have is uh, the Notice of Appeal. You have to apply with the uh, First Year Tax Tribunal 2009 rules. These are all available online, by the way, and we will give links at the end, and I will provide them again as well. I will um, publish them so you can uh, look into the guidance afterwards. You need to provide clear and concise grounds of, of the appeal, given reasons why HMRC's decision is wrong. Uh, and provide a clear explanation of what results the taxpayer is asking um, the FTT to conclude. Normally, you are asking for the appeal to be upheld. Uh, for indirect taxes only, that's the VAT side, uh, the actual appeal won't be accepted, uh, the application won't be accepted unless um, the, either the VAT uh, liability is paid up up front or you have to submit a hardship application to HMRC saying why you can't um, pay the amount and for it to be postponed until the outcome of the hearing and um, the tax tribunal hearing. So that's the only kind of difference between um, indirect and direct tax in regards to that. There has to be a hardship application if it's not paid up front. And with the direct tax, you can ask for the tax to be postponed. Okay, so the key grounds of appeal and um, the grounds of appeal is is a very important document uh, and the reason is it's something that the FTT judge a judge will actually refer to and if you refer to anything outside those grounds of appeal uh, it, you would either have to amend the grounds of appeal uh, which may be difficult uh, and depending on how relevant and important it is uh, but you certainly won't be able to do that on the day of the hearing. Um, it'd be quite difficult to do that. And then you won't be able to refer to um, the additional grounds of appeal. So th this is why it's important. Uh, a lot of thought needs to go into the grounds of appeal um, in order to um, to hear. Uh, it kind of uh, scopes the rest of the, the appeal um, during the, the hearing. So, for example, for our Shane De Silva, 
one of the errors, uh, the grounds of appeal uh, that had been submitted, it was about the unreasonable uh, assessments that the actual tax liability was not due. Um, and if, if that had not been mentioned in the original grounds of appeal, then we wouldn't have been able to expand it further going to upper tax, tri upper tax tribunal. And because it was um, referred to right at the beginning, that just that one detail, um, we managed to widen the grounds as a result. And so that's why the grounds of appeal is definitely very, very important. Um, don't don't um, put, don't restrict yourself by putting too much detail for the less complex um, cases uh, because you can then find yourself kind of trapped within those arguments as a result. But uh, definitely on complex um, cases, Julian, how long would you say your grounds of appeals have been uh, submitted for the longer case, uh, for the more complex cases? Yeah, as, as a rule of thumb, I would, even for complex cases, uh, mm. I, I would try and make sure that everything is within uh, 20 pages, uh, simply because, uh, well, it, it should be capable of expressing your grounds of appeal within 20 pages. And like, like you, Jesmyn, uh, my golden rules uh, for drafting grounds of appeal uh, are to make sure they are a, as clear as possible, as brief as possible, and as persuasive as possible. Of course, those grounds of appeal are at some point going to be seen uh, by the judge. Uh, the grounds of appeal are initially going to be seen by HMRC once the first tier tribunal notifies it to them. Once the revenue are in receipt of the grounds of appeal, as you'll see uh, in a moment from subsequent slides, the revenue are required to provide a statement of case within 60 days, which is their position on the facts and law. So the grounds of appeal are important because they identify the four corners of the dispute going forward, and it's effectively those grounds of appeal which are going to be used by the parties to shape the future conduct of the litigation, because once the tribunal issues the directions timetable, the parties are going to be required to disclose the documents they intend to rely on for the purposes of their respective positions. And what is relevant in terms of that disclosure is going to be determined effectively by the four corners of the grounds of appeal and then any subsequent written statements which the parties rely on. So as, as I say, as a rule of thumb, I would tend to uh, keep it to 20 pages, though I have to confess uh, the longest one that I've ever written, uh, uh, which was uh, on a particularly complex case, was actually uh, bordering on 50 pages uh, but that then resulted in the parties uh, sidestepping litigation. So sometimes there can be value in writing a lot. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just changing my screen. I think I was doing it on the wrong screen. And my team's been screaming at me to change my screen. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we were discussing um, again uh, about the um, application to amend grounds of appeal. So they were, uh, that's why the original grounds of appeal must be clearly thought, thought out uh, and, and, and it does scope the um, nature of the uh, dispute going forward and what can be argued during the hearing. So um, I think we've gone through a lot of this already. Uh, there's um, four categories. Before, uh, before you go into those categories, are you ready for poll five? Because we've got poll four's result. Uh, have yeah. you represented a client at tribunal? 83% of the room have, leaving just under 20, yes. Okay. Are you ready for the next poll? Mm. Or leave it. Have you ever grounded? Yes, that's fine. Number five. Okay. Have you ever ground drafted a notice and grounds of appeal for the tribunal? Got it. Okay. Perfect. Um. Right, so there's four categories mainly. Um, the default paper, 
um, which is uh, basically it's just discussed on um, on paper. It doesn't need the presence of anybody. The judge will just make uh, and make a decision on the submissions. And the basic as well is a similar process. The standard uh, w requires um, further submissions and um, the witness and an actual hearing on the day, um, which you can arrange either virtually or I don't think in. We haven't. I haven't had any um, hearings in person um, now, but it used to be. Um, have you had any hearings in person, Julie? I. The last time I had a hearing in person was probably just over two years ago. Uh, all of my hearings uh, have been virtual uh, through uh, Microsoft Teams, or, or the first tier tribunal has its own uh, bespoke platform. Uh, after perhaps a few teething problems, which are understandable uh, during the out during the start of the pandemic, uh, everything's settled down in terms of uh, stability of the platforms. Uh, I think probably we'll go back uh, very shortly to face-to-face -face, uh, hearings, but uh, the tribunal system's well set up for FTT, other tribunal. Uh, they had hearings in the Court of Appeal on a virtual basis and indeed uh, a couple of weeks ago had a uh, all day hearing uh, involving witness evidence uh, for witnesses in the first tier tribunal. It does work uh, well in terms of the uh, technology but uh, the one problem uh, with uh, virtual hearings is it's obviously very intense, uh, everyone looking at their screens and it does really require uh, quite a significant number of breaks uh, for everyone to uh, rest their eyes and in particular witnesses uh, because uh, they need regular breaks in that situation. Um, I actually like the virtual um, <laughs> version um, because uh, I, I feel like it's more um, less pressure, less in, um, le it's not so intense on the witness. Uh, which tends to be our clients and uh, so they I think they feel more relief rather than uh, the in-person experience is definitely a lot more intimidating on them but I can appreciate if it's we're talking about a few days three to five days then it does get a bit too much it does get too intense um, and so a lot more can, can probably be shared in person um, rather than virtually but um, I don't know, I, I, I found virtual ones for us has been pretty good experience so far. Um, but we've not had to deal with any complex cases as such. So I can see your, your perspective on, on that. So, um, right, so uh, what happens is we've had the notice of appeal um, application being put in, H, uh, the tribunal will acknowledge that and then they will categorise it and then uh, within, uh, when it's been categorised and accepted by um, uh, uh, first tier tax tribunal services, um, it's at this time when you can put an application for ADR, uh, so as a side note, because for ADR one of the conditions is if there's an appeal appealable decision, there must be a valid appeal in place. And at this point, you can apply for ADR, which is alternative dispute resolution, um, but uh, 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 and then they will um, apply for an adjournment um, for, of the case uh, of the hearing. Uh, if not, then within 60 days, uh, HMRC has to provide a statement of case mm -hmm. and from then on, um, HMRC will, um, um, the first tier uh, tax tribunal will, will issue case management directions. So now um, the tribunal services will issue directions which you just need to listen and and, uh, um, and submit whenever they tell you. So they're telling you when the deadlines are, what you have to do. Um, it's a lot more straightforward. Even if you're not clear what the directions are, you can uh, email or just phone up the tribunal in order to clarify what you're supposed to do. So from that point on, you shouldn't be in a position where you're not quite sure what's happening and what you should be doing next. So HMRC now provides the statement case, which is will be a summary of their of the legal uh, technical position and um it's just worth actually jesden uh, before you leave this slide commenting 
on one point, which is for all appeals, apart from complex appeals, uh, the general principle is that the taxpayer is solely on risk for their own costs. Uh, they're not on risk for HMRC's costs if they were in the position of losing. Uh, now, if you have a co case which is categorised as complex, which is done in one of three situations, so effectively the FTT evaluates the notice and grounds of appeal, and the case is allocated to the complex track, if it requires lengthy or complex evidence or lengthy hearing, involves a complex or important point of uh, law, uh, or involves a large financial sum. Now, if it is allocated to the complex track, then if you don't opt out of what's called the complex cost regime, is that whoever loses in the first tier tribunal, then they are liable for the winning party's costs. Now, it tends not to be the case that costs are awarded on what's called an indemnity basis, so 100%, but if I was to put my finger in the air, it would probably be around circa 60-65% uh, of the costs. Uh, my advice to clients always is, if your case is allocated to the complex track, to opt out within the period which is notified uh, to you by the first tier tribunal. So you can opt out out of the complex cost regime, but you still remain in uh, the very uh, detailed uh, and comprehensive complex case management directions process. Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen any like claims for cost on the on the standard. We don't normally have that on the on the standard, but no, it, it is okay. So, but you would have that on more complex. I mean, yeah. we definitely when you get to upper tax tribunal, because we've had one case where um, where. Uh, the majority of the work, I would say, putting the bundle together, documents together, was done by us. But HMRC put an extraordinary claim in for over thirty thousand pounds, and we couldn't figure out for what, um, what work exactly. Uh, and Julian kindly managed to actually reduce the claim for the cost from thirty something to five thousand uh, because it, it was. Um, it was ridiculous the claim they put in uh, for not for half an hour hearing at the end of the day um so or it was an hour hearing on that day so yeah that was even if if you have something like that where you don't think it's a commercial um uh, commercially justified then uh, then you can still dispute it but that's a whole process a different a whole process in itself yeah, yeah I mean, just, just, just to comment on that, in relation to appeals to the upper tribunal, then both sides are on risks, risk for the other side's costs uh, if they lose. And, and as you rightly say, uh, Jasmine, uh, that there's no uh, guiding uh, criteria as to what is the right amount of the costs, and effectively it ends up parties making submissions on uh, what costs should be paid. Okay, so you have the statement of case, and as I've um, um, summarised, it is a, a position, the summary of the te technical position on HMRC side. So it's, it's a very useful document, especially if you've come in uh, afterwards, you've taken off uh, over a case, and it's already, um, the tribunal appeal has been submitted, and then you've got this statement of case, which summarises the whole case carefully um yeah but uh make sure that you understand it's their case it's not it's not uh, going to have a complete balanced view taking your the appellant's um or your client's case into view um and I, i've read casement of st uh, statement of case where there was very pertinent facts completely left out um so uh, take that into consideration um okay so the overriding objective of uh, FTT is um, dealing with cases fairly and justly. And you see that as a principle that runs throughout the whole process and even on the day. Uh, and the judge is always keen to make sure that both sides are given equal weight, that both sides are um, have a fair representation and both are, sides are just are, are considered on a just basis. And so the judge always will make those efforts to um, keep a balanced view all throughout the whole process. The FTT case management or the tribunal services, they've got a wide range of powers um, to make directions. So 
they would they can extend or shorten the time limits you can request that if you need further time you can actually request the tribunal um, uh, for further time but giving a reasonable excuse why you need that further time um, if, uh, the tribunal services can also require a party to provide documents information or submissions to FTT or party or they can adjourn or postpone a hearing um, again, there has to be good reasons for that, and they can um, uh, issue stay of proceedings. Um, and also, if there's a failure to comply with FTT rules, they can actually strike out the appeal. And um, that's why this is all very important, because directions, and I've seen some uh, clients who have actually done this, they've taken it in a very haphazard manner, not very seriously, because there is an administrative process, but actually it does have a, a legal uh, force behind it. If you don't comply with the directions, then you can uh, possibly, uh, the whole appeal can be struck out as a result. There is one um, question that I do find interesting, that if you think HMRC is left to pertinent document out and they haven't disclosed it. Julian, would you be able to get the FTT, apply to the FTT for HMRC to make them disclose that document? Yes, yeah, so, well, as we'll see in a moment from the directions timetable, uh, once you receive the revenue statement of case, uh, both parties are required to disclose the documents upon which they intend to rely. Now, tribunal proceedings are very different uh, from uh, general uh, civil litigation, because in general civil litigation, uh, there's something called what's called standard disclosure, which is both parties have to disclose documents which are adverse to their case or advance the other side's uh, case. Uh, there's no similar concept uh, for tax tribunal proceedings, I suspect. Well, uh, the reality is the tribunal rules are just different, but I suspect the reason for that is uh, doing the revenues inquiry, uh, because they have extensive information powers uh, under Schedule 36, and of course they would have uh, had sight of all of the taxpayers' uh, statutory records, then the revenue will have tended to have seen all the relevant documents. But of course, the flip side is there might be uh, an area where the taxpayer wants to identify whether HMRC has any documents of relevance concerning the appeal. And that may be particularly uh, pertinent in the context of discovery assessments where HMRC have to demonstrate the legal burden is on them. They have to demonstrate uh, that they've made a discovery, for example. Now, if you do you think that there might be relevant material, you have to make an application to the first tier well, obviously, in the first instance, you can ask the revenue uh, to check and to disclose anything of relevance. Uh, obviously, if they refuse to at that point, uh, you are able to apply to the first tier tribunal for something called specific disclosure. Uh, and that does involve formal application to the FTT. And that application is only going to get traction uh, if it is for disclosure of relevant documents, so documents which are going to be probative uh, and, and support uh, the taxpayers' uh, grounds of appeal, their arguments. Uh, and in that context, the FTT, uh, after hearing from the revenue, uh, would direct disclosure in relation to uh, basically a requirement to investigate whether there are any particular classes of documents relating to that particular point. So that's all a very long-winded way of saying, yes, it's possible. Yeah, as long as you show it's relevant to the case and, it, uh, and it's essential for the argument going forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, effectively. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have um, like a summary of the um, actual process. So you've got the statement of case that HMRC has to provide within 60 days of the directions issued by FTT. Um, then you've got a list of documents so each party has to provide within 42 days of the delivery of the statement of case um, the actual list. Um, you can apply to do it. You can um, do it together with HMRC and say, can we do a joint list of documents um, in order and also um, uh, agree with HMRC to provide a joint bundle as well. Uh, but be very careful. Make sure that all your documents, everything is included in the list and the actual bundle. Um, 
you, then uh, FTT will also tell you when to submit the witness statements, um, when the exchange of witness statements should take place, the actual li listing information, which is um, details of uh, dates to avoid the actual admin side of the hearing, uh, what days you're av not available, um, how if it's a virtual hearing, then you know, do you if it's a virtual. Uh, do you have a suitable environment and so on? So all those kind of details you need in order to ensure um, that the hearing can take place. Then you have a bundle of documents, again, within a spe specified time limit. Normally, it's like 14 days before the actual hearing, um, or um, it really depends on, on, uh, on the directions because you could have also the skeleton case um, argument here or the outline of the argument you're going to put forward. 21 days before hearing uh, and HMRC can provide 14 days before the hearing. Again, that changes because sometimes we have it like a skeleton argument has to be submitted 14 days before. So it's really key that whatever um, time limits it's set by FTT is what you need to adhere to. Um, you could have, uh, is, that, is this more for like the complex cases like taxpayer, the reply seven days before hearing, Julian? Yeah, for, for standard and complex uh, category cases, the standard cases and complex directions timetable effectively is set out on that uh, slide. Standard category cases, uh, skeleton arguments, the outline of the case as is sometimes referred to, are, ex are exchanged simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, in complex cases, then the appellant displays this as 21 days before the hearing, then the revenue 14 days. Uh, before, for a very complex case, you might have a right of reply built into the directions uh, from the taxpayer. Uh, but generally, uh, there should be no surprises at the point of exchange of skeleton arguments because everything should have been foreshadowed uh, during the earlier part of the revenue investigation, closure notices, uh, etc. So, um, and then you've got the, uh, as well as the bundle of documents, uh, which you're going to rely on during the hearing, you have the legal authorities bundles. Um, so all the uh, tax cases and the legislation you're going to rely on. Um, and so the actual delivery of bundles, although now we've got the PDF, co uh, PDF copies, it's uh, a lot easier. Um, and then you have the uh, witness attendance and the right to request a new directions. Could you kind of explain that a bit more, the witness attendance and the right to request new directions? Yeah, so uh, once you've exchanged witness statements, then at that point, you will be expected to arrange for your witnesses to be available on the day of the hearing and to be available to be cross-examined uh, by the other side. So witness attendance uh, is compulsory uh, un under the directions. Uh, in terms of right to request new directions, obviously uh, things can happen. Uh, dates can slip. So at that point, uh, before there's actually a breach of the directions timetable, it's it's necessary to pick up the phone, email someone on the other side and say, look, there's a problem for the following reasons in terms of compliance with, let's say, service of bundle of documents or exchange of witness statements. Can we please amend? So we're given an extra uh, five to seven days. Mm. Hopefully uh, that can be mutually agreed and then uh, the FTT can be asked to uh, effectively rubber stamp uh, the party's agreement uh, to altering the directions timetable. So there is the ability to seek an amendment to the directions timetable, but don't let the date slip mm. and then ask, uh, then make an application. It's necessary to engage before uh, there's a problem on the date. Because HMRC have tried that tactic. If the uh, directions haven't been adhered to, they have actually applied for the appeals to be struck out. Um, yeah, and, and you know, it, it, it can go both ways. Uh, as you rightly said, Jasmine, the directions are there for a particular uh, reason, and that's to ensure certainty in mitigation and that the resources of all the parties, including the tribunal, are used in the right way. So if a slip up does happen and it's an innocent slip up, then no doubt that will be dealt with 
in the right way, but if you have someone who consistently, whether it's taxpayer or the revenue, who fails to comply uh, for whatever reason without justification to the direction of timetable, then it is open to uh, the parties, uh, the innocent party, to apply to the FTT for effectively a strike out of the other side's case if they haven't complied, or effectively for what's called an unless order uh, mm. under Rule 8. So unless, so the FTT says, unless you comply by a certain date, your appeal may or shall be uh, struck out. And the flip side is you can also seek as a taxpayer uh, an application against the revenue, which is, which is called a barring order, which is a leading case on this is uh, BPP University, which is a VAT case, went all the way to in court and related to a certain default in relation to a statement of case which wasn't provided or lack of clarity in giving further and better uh, particulars. So there is a mechanism in there to make sure each of the relevant parties complies. So it's not just a uh, suggestive or discretionary timetable, it's a very clear and definite timetable where if it's going to be amended, it does require an application uh, to be made. And, and, and so I'm just re-emphasizing, that's why the directions are so important um, to adhere to. And uh, the tribunal won't look at just if you think, oh, I've, um, I've, I've uh, um, submitted it late, maybe two days late or one day late, just after five. Um, they will look at the whole behavior throughout the, throughout the case. So if there's been other directions that they that has been missed by a few days or whatever, um, then that is uh, th that that will be taken into um, consideration as well. Yeah, um, the history of non-compliance will be looked at in the round. Uh, so it's obviously always important as a practical measure just to have plenty of diary reminders uh, for deadlines for cases. Uh, of course, innocent slips do happen but that's then going to require a justification. But then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got uh, mass non-compliance with a direct timetable, which uh, can be problematic. And in those circumstances, it's probably likely to face an application for strike out of the appeal. Julian, can I just confirm, can you see my um, the PowerPoint side? Because I've got a um, notification coming up that participants can see my screen so I, I can see your screen and I can see the case management of standard and complex cases like okay. I can see your screen too uh, the, okay uh, that's all right <laughs> okay preparation for the hearing are we ready for poll six we've done poll five uh, have you ever drafted the notice and grounds of appeal uh, Lily 30 percent are yes and 80, 70 80 percent no Okay, that's good. That's good to know. Thank you very much. Um, so we, we're going to go into much more detail um, over the list of documents and so on. Um, so the list, list of document, again, um, it's, it's 40 days after on which the respond uh, 42 days after which the respondents um, HMRC provide their statements of case. And, and uh, again, um, which the party providing the list has possession, the right to possession or the right to take copies and so on. I do apologise because it's linked with my iMac. It's, I've silent my phone, but not my iMac, unfortunately. Um, and I don't know how to do that. So. Aeroplane Aer mode, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Okay. Um, and that's when it's not such a good thing to have everything connected. This is this is okay. Where are this we? is the fun of going live. <laughs> yep. No, you're you're on list of documents. I, I, I think probably we've uh, we've gone through commented it. on this, didn't we? Yes. In terms of specific disclosure and my point about uh, uh, when you can make specific disclosure, and obviously we've got witness statements. Yeah, they've disclosed the documents and so on. Um, yeah, we have gone through this. Um, witness statements are um, rather than I mean I'm sure everyone can re uh, read read the slide, but it's uh, witness statements are so important. It has to be in the words of the of the of the actual witness. So it should not be pre-written. 
it shouldn't be written by a third party because there will be an issue when they're put on the stand and they can't explain why certain statements have been made and then the witness statement just lose all credibility as a result and the judge won't take it into much consideration be, uh, because it's, it's just been shown not to be authentic or the witness or in the witness own words so i've i've had a, um, a case uh, with you know initiative where she was absolutely um, an excellent witness uh, she she wrote the witness statements we did go through it with her but they were in her own words and so when she was cross-examined by hmrc her authenticity, the authenticity um, and it came across this was her words. And so it added weight. Um, uh, and I think uh, the quality of the witness in herself and the way she uh, put across her own account of things did uh, provide, uh, contribute a lot to the success of that case as a result and uh, and, the, uh, and the late application to appeal had been upheld as a result. But on the other hand, I have come across cases where we even had a solicitor um, who was uh, um, a, presented a witness statement, but it was not written by herself. And when she was cross-examined, it was very obvious it wasn't written by herself. And in that um, specific in, in, in situation, she actually shot herself in the foot and did a complete U-turn as a result. Because um, it's quite an intense experience being cross-examined by HMRC. HMRC caseworkers, the way they work, they make naturally very good witnesses because everything they do has to be done in a chronological order. Um, and so it does, it is quite um, more, more, uh, more, more, um, they make better witness as a, as such when they put on on the stand because they can say on a factual basis and um, in a, chronolo a chronological order as a result. But um, uh, the, the our clients or the taxpayer is not naturally inclined uh, to present their uh, a witness statement in such a way. So um, this is why we put this here because just... sometimes yeah a witness statement can. Um, be one of the most essential parts of a uh, hearing. Sorry, Julian, you wanted to add something. No, no, sorry, I didn't mean to talk across you. Just to add that uh, from the judge's perspective, the maximum weight is going to be put on the contemporaneous documents. So the documents which were entered into at the time, the transaction documents, the accounts which were uh, created uh, by the accountant, to reflect the relevant financial period, accounts which have been audited, bank statements uh, which were created at the relevant time, those are all contemporaneous documents. Of course, the great problem with witness evidence is that appeal hearings tend to happen at least three years, five years uh, after the relevant tax period. So when you seek to rely on uh, witness evidence, uh, obviously, an individual will not have absolute recollection of three, five years ago, let alone perhaps even uh, one week ago, week ago with any clarity uh, as, as to what happened. Uh, so if you're going to rely on a witness, uh, it shouldn't simply be to repeat what is in the documents because that has no value whatsoever and will deeply irritate, irritate quite rightly uh, the tribunal. Uh, so if you're going to rely on a witness, is to fill in the gaps if something's not recorded in the documents or let's say it's a VAT point on economic reality, so what happened in practice in the supply chain or if it's a penalty case, uh, what did the individual do in terms of seeking to rely on a professional advisor, why did they fill in their tax return uh, in a particular way. And so you've got to think very carefully if you are going to uh, rely on witness evidence and there's the point which Jesmond highlighted which is that uh, if you're not used to uh, assisting a person in drafting a witness statement, then my advice is uh, get a general litigation solicitor to take a note of the individual's evidence for the litigation solicitor to create a draft uh, for the witness, but it needs to be very clearly stated to the witness that they must read through the draft witness statement and make any changes which they want to have 
changed, including additions, deletions, insertions, because it is their witness statement, because it's that bullet point third from the bottom, which is they are signing a statement of truth, which is to the best of their knowledge and belief, the contents of that statement are true, and it is their statement. And if it's not their statement, that causes big problems for them. It's civil contempt, and it's interfering with the administration of justice. And I'm aware of one case where someone was sentenced, not in FTT hearings, but in other uh, related proceedings to a period of custody. So if there's any recklessness or deliberate conduct in seeking to mislead, it is very problematic uh, for the individual. They can go take proceedings in a very different direction. So one needs to deal with witness statements in the right way and get the right person involved to assist in drafting them if need be. Sorry, I'll get off my hobby horse. Oh, no, no, that, that, no, that was um, that was really good. Um, you put that across quite uh, very well. Uh, would you recommend that we should always um, put the appellant on the on the witness stand? No, every, every case is uh, obviously fact sensitive. Uh, sometimes, if you don't need to fill in the gaps and you've got a full set of contemporaneous documents, and let's say there's no penalties, uh, it might you perhaps just don't need to rely on the appellant to give ev evidence. Uh, of course, the FTT is entitled to the best possible evidence which is available, and it may be appropriate to get the appellant to go into the witness box and to be subject to cross-examination if anyone has any questions, whether from the revenue or from the tribunal judge, but as I say, everything is fact sensitive. Just simply putting witnesses in for the sake of it obviously doesn't uh, serve any purpose. Uh, but equally, if uh, the case raises issues where you need a live person to be cross examined, then you need to deploy them if they're willing to give evidence. Uh, uh, and the reason they should be deployed in those circumstances is that uh, if you don't rely on a witness when you could, then an adverse inference can be drawn as to why you've not called them. Uh, and the tribunal judge can take into account the fact that a witness hasn't been called. He may have had or would have had relevant evidence. So that's not going to assist, obviously, in those circumstances, the appellant's case. Um, I, I, I don't normally like putting my um, clients on the witness stand, but I've had uh, comments on that from the tribunal judges and they make like we would have uh, we, we it would have been good to see the appellant on the witness stand so we could have cross-examined them and asked further questions so I've had that comment and that's when I realized well perhaps may have uh, maybe I should have put them on the stand because I think that also if if there's um if there's a lack of opportunity for the judge and for the respondent to cross-examine the witness um, then it makes it less robust, I suppose, the, any statements that's been put across by, uh, yes. by the client as a result. Yeah, and of course, if there's very few questions, then it's over and done with in very short order. Okay, so I think we've, we've um, uh, gone through this. The other, just the other point um, I'd like to put across is uh, case workers, when they're dealing with um, the the actual uh, dispute, which leads to the dispute and and uh, and the impasse, case workers don't understand the the weight of oral evidence that can be put across in in during the tribunal hearings. So a lot of the times you will see during the actual process um, in the correspondence that they will dismiss a lot of things that the client may say out of hand, especially during a meeting, and they don't give it any um, an, any weight. But you will see, like, for example, during the ADR, the mediation process, that is definitely given weight. And, um, and because caseworkers aren't really 
trained in that area to understand how an oral, oral evidence can have an impact on a case. So that's all, always one key thing you can put across to the caseworker that at a tribunal hearing, the oral evidence would actually be given weight and here you are, maybe you're dismissing out of hand what our client is actually saying or their account of things. So um, and generally, um, caseworkers don't tend to give uh, weight to what the client may orally put across. Okay, so the skeleton argument um, is, it's um, an, an outline of the argument, it's another document that is essential um, as part of, and from where you will be uh, representing your case um, that you would follow through during, on the day of the hearing. So it's got to be um, concise, it has to define in, um, the area of controversy or the tax dispute in, should be clearly numbered because um, sometimes a child, you know, you might refer back to it or the judge may refer back to it and you want to be able to say, yes, um, you know, so it's at this bit or this bit. So you need to refer to it. Uh, you need to be able to cross -re reference to any relevant document in the bundle. Um, again, uh, also, there, there will always be uh, a legal uh, side, of it, side to it in that you must have the technical points there, the actual technical dispute, um, and it must be concise. It's not meant to be, again, war and peace. Uh, keep it in co as concisely as possible because it's something that the judge is going to uh, read beforehand, not, most of the time about seven days beforehand, and that's the um, argument, for, um, that's the document from which you'd be presenting your case. Um, could you like present a new argument on the day or if it kind of comes, branches out, would you be able to do that, Julie? Gen generally, no. Uh, so going back to the earlier uh, point, the grounds of appeal, uh, which define and effectively confine uh, the scope of the appeal because obviously the document disclosure, the witness evidence has all been based on uh, the four corners of the appeal. So you can't have effectively uh, argument uh, or submissions or an appeal by ambush. There has to be clarity and transparency uh, from every side's uh, perspective. Uh, and as we've set out on that slide, uh, the skeleton should reflect very concisely, no more than 20 pages, uh, the legal issues to be decided uh, by the tribunal, a summary of the relevant chronology, uh, cross-reference to the underlying hearing bundle, uh, clear statement of the legal uh, propositions which you're relying on uh, in relation to statute, case law, ideally cross-referring to the underlying legal authority bundle, uh, if, let's say, at the 11th hour, a new point, and it's a point of law, which is spotted, uh, then obviously we've got to act in the best interest of our client, and that new point, for whatever reason, might have been spotted at the 11th hour because, let's say, a new piece of case law uh, has been released, uh, or perhaps the point's only just been spotted, uh, then, of course, it needs to be raised but at that point, there needs to be abs an absolute focus as to what is the impact on raising that new point on the conduct of the case. So the revenue are going to have to be notified as soon as possible. Uh, you guys need to take a view as to whether or not there's any prejudice uh, to how the case is going to be presented. So if it's a pure point of law and the other side has enough time to address it, uh, then it's possible that the first tier tribunal judge will allow that point to be developed. But if it's an 11th hour point, which is going to derail the litigation, then it's highly unlikely that you're going to be allowed to uh, develop it at that point. Okay, it's good to know. Okay, the e-bundles, again, um, there are already um, guidance um, provided by the tribunal on the formatting and how it should be uh, presented. Um, the, you can organize for to do a joint um, a bundle with uh, HMRC, which would actually reduce a lot of the uh, admin, um, uh, the onus on, on, on your side. 
uh, if you do it jointly with HMRC. But then you have to be really careful. Um, I, I one tip is I always provide a timeline, um, a chronological um, timeline, what happened when with the reference to the document in the bundle and that actually um, saved me in one uh, hearing because it became evident uh, on, the, on the morning that uh, HMRC had submitted a, um, a bundle of documents with uh, half of our documents missing and uh, the judge then saw from the timeline that actually uh, they've admitted a lot of our documents and uh, and we had evidence of that, and they actually gave us uh, seven more days to uh, resubmit the bundles as a result, and the decision was then uh, published from there on. And that was actually a, a successful case, uh, uh, despite uh, HMRC's um, uh, bungling, I would say, in that in that uh, in that hearing. So uh, we we actually uh, had our appeal um, upheld in that case. But there's been um, other times when there's a pertinent document um, that's been missing that was essential to our case. So you always need to double check uh, the e-bundles that have been submitted. There was another time when we literally were on a different page. Uh, HMRC submitted one format to uh, the tribunal and gave us a different format. And we were literally on different pages as a result. So. Um, it, it's always uh, important to double check uh, what's being submitted make and also have that timeline in place with the references of all the documents with it um, so you have an audit trail. Uh, the timeline I find quite um, important because what you want to do is ease the judges um, um, I suppose administrative burden make it easier for them to assimilate all the information because there is a lot of information that the judge needs to go through and uh, they always appreciate any help um, in uh, making making it easier to take in all the documents so I've had one judge when I um, and one of the things I've noticed um, Julian does as well uh, at the beginning of every hearing he always checks with everyone um, do you have do you have this document, this document, and this document? And I do the same thing because it's become apparent at times, especially if it's been emailed separately, that that hasn't been passed on the judge onto the judge. And I would say to the judge, uh, you know, um, Madam, I I did have a timeline. Um, I did submit that, and she actually stopped the hearing, gave me her direct um, email address, and said, "Please, can you send that to me now? Because that would have been really helpful for her." So this is why the uh, document, uh, the e-bundle management, is very, very important. You need to know your bundle inside out. You're going to be going it's through right, it yeah. um, throughout the whole hearing. You can't afford to flap around and say, well, I can't find this page. You need to tag whatever you're going to look at beforehand so you know exactly what your argument is. Um, I know Julian likes to print his um, bundle out, but I still have mine on, on the screen and I just have post-it notes all over to you so I can um, refer to the page quickly. And um, and also make sure you check all the hyperlinks because I think with both of us experienced that as well. The hyperlink took us to a different page um, than it's supposed to. <laughs> so just make sure that that is done, um, that, that is all double checked because believe me, the judge will appreciate that a lot on the day. Um, again, we will we'll provide links to um, the guidance um, beforehand. So, um, yeah, come back again. Julie, do you want to go through what happens on the day of the hearing? Yeah, just just very briefly in terms of uh, the sequence of events, whether it's for a one day hearing, one week, or you know, long longer hearing. Uh, the legal burden of proof uh, tends to be on the taxpayer to prove their case on what's called the civil standard, the balance of probability. So. Uh, in terms of who opens, it's uh, the taxpayer uh, in, in the first instance. So you open your case, and it's by reference to your skeleton argument. Uh, you shouldn't be reading out your skeleton argument, because obviously the judge and tribunal uh, will have read that uh, at the time uh, they had sight of it, uh, 14 days, 7 days uh, before the hearing. So 
you need to craft your opening uh, in order to effectively take the tribunal through what the relevant issues are to decide, uh, give the tribunal uh, an overview framework of the relevant statutory provisions and the principal uh, case law which is being relied on. So once the tribunal has that overview uh, framework, you can then switch over to developing your uh, submissions on the evidence. So it's that second uh, bullet point under taxpayer, it's then opening up the underlying hearing bundle and going through all of the core documents which you rely on, identifying all the relevant sections, passages uh, for the tribunal and just taking that slowly and methodically uh, and making your points on the documents. And then once you've finished on the underlying, what I call the underlying contemporaneous documents, uh, then inviting your witnesses to give evidence and whether you've got one or more, you uh, call them to give evidence uh, and they may or may not give uh, their evidence under oath. You then take them to their witness evidence in the bundle, ask them to confirm whether or not it's true to the best of their knowledge and belief. Is there anything they want to uh, amend? Uh, assuming the answer is uh, no, uh, and you have no further supplementary questions, uh, then they will be cross-examined uh, by HMRC. And of course, the focus of any cross-examination is to undermine the credibility of the witness through showing that their recollection uh, isn't uh, what they thought it was, uh, that due to the passage of time, uh, they can't be as certain as they think they were in their witness statement, uh, show inconsistencies between their pleaded case and what they're now saying, uh, so that when the judge seeks to uh, reach a view as to the findings of fact, the judge is persuaded not to put as much weight or any weight uh, on what, what the witness is saying. After the cross-examination, uh, you then have a right to re-examine, but in my view, uh, generally uh, a re-examination uh, is unlikely because you can only ask open-ended uh, questions, and if for whatever reason the witness hasn't performed well, then it's unlikely uh, that they're going to do any better uh, through a re-examination. After the witness evidence is finished, you then formally close your case uh, by drawing together all of your submissions on the documents and the witness evidence and any further final legal submissions you want to make. It then goes to the revenue to open their case, call their evidence, make their submissions on the documents, call their witness witnesses for you then to cross-examine their witness, uh, and then the revenue closes its case. And because it's a taxpayer, uh, you would then have what's called the right of reply, which is not an opportunity to then open up uh, and, and yet again comment on your opening uh, uh, position. It's a right of reply. So it's effectively to focus on and deal with any new points which have arisen uh, during the course of the revenues case. So an overview, that is the anatomy of uh, a first tier tribunal hearing. Um and uh, and just another point um, which I uh, I'd like to add is that um, you can also apply to join uh, appeals, so they don't need to, if, especially if they're related to each other. So, for example, it's the same appellant, but they've got um, a, a VAT a VAT appeal or income tax or corporation tax appeal as well, and it's it's uh, it's the basically the same ca case but different tax heads. You can apply to join them. Um, I it, it just reduces the costs on behalf of the uh, appellant. You can uh, I've certainly done that with the personal liability notices and the company assessments. So just yesterday I was hearing about how um, the the client had to pay for two separate tribunal appeals when they could have been easily joined. So that basically doubled their costs when it didn't need to be. 
uh, and there's ways you can also co cooperate with HMRC as well as in regards to the bundle of documents and so on, making sure that you double check everything um, that the HMRC does do. So there are ways to reduce the, um, the administrative burden on behalf of the um, client or the appellant, uh, which may not be so apparent, um, which now I'm, I'm sharing uh, um, at this time. So we've gone, we've gone through the day, we've had the uh, hearing, um, we've gone through the fact that the grounds of appeal, which the judge will refer to here, is one of those important documents. You've got your outline uh, of the case, your actual skeleton argument. You have the bundles of documents which you should be very familiar with, um, you, and also the legal authorities, which you should again be very familiar with, and you'd be, uh, there should be referral to that in your um, uh, skeleton argument. And you've got the witness statement as well. So you can see there's essential documents um, there that you will need at hand during the um, hearing and which you must be very, very familiar with. So what happens after the um, uh, after the hearing? Um, so it can, uh, an FTT can give its decision either at the hearing or in writing. Uh, we, the, the, we, the quickest we response I've had, and I don't think Julian's heard of this, and this is why we weren't very happy with the Shane to Silver case, uh, and that was a late application uh, for appeal. Uh, literally five minutes turnaround. He kind of went through the door and the judge came back after five minutes and said um, well, he, didn't up, uh, up, he, he did not uh, uphold the uh, appeal. Um, because it just felt to us that literally only five minutes consideration had been given and not very thorough consideration. And that also led to a lot of dissatisfaction uh, on our side and uh, definitely on the appellant's so our client side, uh, which is um, uh, which also led to an error of law, which we are now taking all the way to via uh, Julian to Court of Appeal. So that's the fastest um, turnaround we've had. Um, how about yourself? What's the average turnaround of decisions and the longest that you've had, Julian? Yeah, I've. For, for, it, let's say it's a case management uh, hearing where the parties are effectively making their submissions during the course of a half day or, or day. Uh, sometimes uh, the judge will come back uh, after a break of half an hour, an hour uh, and deliver uh, a judgment for a substantive uh, decision. It, on average, I would say, takes between eight to 12 weeks uh, for the decision uh, to be released. Uh, the more complex cases I've been involved in, it has taken, uh, or the longest has been one year uh, for the decision uh, to be released. So I, I would say on average, uh, it, it, it's eight, eight to 12 weeks. Uh, obviously, when you do receive uh, the decision, uh, you always want to know, have you won? Uh, so that's the last page is usually looked at. Uh, see uh, is, is the appeal allowed. Uh, if not, uh, then obviously it needs to be uh, thoroughly uh, read to identify whether there are any grounds of appeal. So is there uh, any identifiable error of law in the decision? So has the judge misconstrued the legislation, misapplied uh, the case law, uh, drawn the wrong inferences uh, on the uh, underlying documents, drawn the wrong inferences on the witness evidence, or perhaps even fundamentally uh, mis misunderstood the appellant's case. Uh, the appeal was made in the first instance to the first tier uh, tribunal uh, judge uh, within, uh, I'm sure Jasmine will correct me if I'm wrong, within 56 days in uh, writing. If the FTT judge uh, grants you permission to appeal, then you notify the appeal to the other tribunal. Uh, if you're refused permission on the papers, then you have to then make a paper application to the upper tribunal, uh, addressing, uh, again, why you say there's an error, and also then addressing uh, the written refusal from the FTT judge. If you get permission at that point, then you notify the appeal into the upper tribunal. 
if you refuse it on the papers by the upper tribunal, then you have a last chance of making oral submission to an upper tribunal judge, which on average lasts between an hour, well, half an hour to an hour. Uh, and in that context, you need to be exceptionally focused, concise, engage the judge, and it is possible, uh, as, as when Jasmine got involved with the Shane de Silva case, it was a point where we were um, at the oral uh, submission uh, hearing and uh, the judge was fully engaged and granted us permission to appeal. So even if you're turned down uh, on the papers, uh, there is always the possibility uh, that the judge can be persuaded as an oral permission hearing. Okay. Um, Tony Margaret, uh, Tony's asking here, do judges react differently to appellants that represent themselves and also when an appellant brings in big named lawyers for relatively straightforward cases? I, I, I think all judges, uh, they are obviously independently appointed by the Judicial Appointments Commission. Uh, a judge will obviously bear in mind that an unrepresented party is in a very different position from a professionally represented party. So if someone is a litigant in person, uh, then the judge is going to be mindful, obviously, of furthering the overriding objective, of uh, making sure that the proceedings are fair and just, and obviously seeking to enable that litigant in person to uh, fully understand and participate in the hearing. Uh, when I have represented HMRC against a litigant in person. Uh, I am, I'm sure everyone uh, in a similar position is painfully aware that you're acting against a unrepresented party. So you need to assist the tribunal and also assist that unrepresented party by obviously putting forward your case, but also flagging where there are potential issues which need to be addressed by the first tier tribunal judge. Uh, and the judge on either will be aware of those points or not, but on being made aware of them, will seek to address them with the appellant. So obviously that can make for a very long day or days uh, when you're dealing with an unrepresented party. Uh, if you are professionally represented, then obviously it is a very different situation because everyone is fully expected to be aware of the rules, the dividing line uh, in terms of how the grounds of appeal are to be drafted, how that then causes the disclosure process to unfold, what documents need to be disclosed, identifying all the relevant arguments and the skeleton arguments is going to be relatively detailed and focused but obviously within that good old page limit although there's not a formal page limit as i say it does need to be succinct and focused so yeah i mean it will be a different form of presentation and argument <coughs> and hopefully on the day the judge is going to be persuaded but as i say for the first tier tribunal it's the first night and last night of the play there's no second chances in terms of getting any fresh evidence in. Uh, so even if you end up losing at the FTT, you're setting yourself mm. into the best possible position for an appeal onwards. You, you can't um, submit any additional documents um, when you go forwards from first year tax tribunal. So again, that's why the bundle of documents is so um, so important. Um, I have done sneaky things like if something's been left out of the bundle of documents, I have slipped it under the witness statement as one of the appendices, um, and yeah. as long as it's relevant to the witness statement. So I have done that um, and added several documents, but that's that's fine too. That's accepted. Um, uh, the I think the. Other issue is, is again, once you're at um, FDT and um, the, ground, the grounds of appeal, again, is really important and you can see how it's relevant all the way through because you can't remake them or resubmit them. There will be like the same grounds that are used throughout the whole process, um, including upper tax tribunal. And it's on that point you have to illustrate 
um, where the error of law is. So it does fundamentally really narrow down uh, your grounds of appeal going forward. And that's why um, the FTT stage is so, so important that everything is like setting up your store, that everything um, has been uh, completely, uh, um, um, all the documents have been uh, submitted as it should be and all the details um, everything has been submitted that you will need going forward otherwise you could literally be shooting yourself in the foot when you go forward to upper tax tribunal and it makes it very very difficult yeah. uh, to expand and it, it's also worth adding that uh, just because the notice of appeal is filed yeah. it doesn't mean it's say it's going to go forward to a substantive hearing mm. i've had cases which have settled on exchange of witness statements because it's become very clear that there's been a misunderstanding with that apprehension about the evidence and that's resulted in uh, assessments being withdrawn so it's an opportunity for resolving uh, the dispute through the litigation process but don't assume it's always going to end up in a hearing and um it's all, I've looked at the stats as well. It's interesting to see that HMRC success rate is about 88% at first tier tax tribunal. Um, the most recent stats are for December 2021. And I know there was a lot more cases heard at tribunal. 711 um, cases were was heard in December, uh, probably in the race to get as much possible done before Christmas leave, um, annual break. Uh, so by that time, uh, you have the most hardened kind of disputes um, uh, reaching tribunal. Because normally, if HMRC sees there, they have made uh, there is an error in their understanding or their case is not robust, uh, they don't normally proceed um, um, to the extent of a tribunal hearing. Uh, I have seen they will throw everything at it to get them to maximize the settlement. I have seen that approach and being ex HMRC um, myself, um, I do know it's used in order to get the best settlement for HMRC. Uh, but there will be a settlement, especially if they think it's going to be um, embarrassing for HMRC at um, at tribunal. Saying that, it's not always worked. For example, a reasonable excuse where they took a homeless person um uh to a tribunal hearing uh in regards to late filing the um um penalty uh and things ridiculous situations like that, that does happen because they do not have caseworkers and perhaps tribunal here um caseworkers shouldn't has have as does not have such a thorough understanding of what um the legal uh, the uh, understanding behind reasonable excuses and this is why it's still being contested in first year tax tribunal to this day um, and in their guidance they still have like death or serious illness as a reasonable excuse and i and i've said it, that's not a reasonable excuse that's an exceptional re excuse so we need to notch it down um, um, a peg or two of what hmrc considers to be reasonable but that can only go forward if it's tested in first uh, tier tax tribunal. Because a lot of the cases, sometimes they don't reach um, to that extent because it's not cost effective for the appellant, for the client. Uh, it, it, um, it's deemed as it's more cost effective or cheaper to just settle and pay the tax rather than go to tribunal because you would have to pay for representation which can be costly for costly for the client um, and so you have situations where it hasn't really been tested on a technical principle uh, because it's been withdrawn beforehand as a result of the cost effectiveness which i think is kind of unfortunate in one way because a lot more of the technical points would be contested and um, and defined as a result so interestingly, when I was with HMRC back in 2010, there was only one deliberate penalty issued in London. And I remember um, in a conference, we were basically getting told off for only issuing one penalty, one deliberate penalty, because no one wanted to go forward on, um, on issuing those penalties. It was very unfamiliar to the culture of HMRC at the time. And uh, 
uh, come forward to 2022 and is um, more contested. Um, so uh, I this leads us um, to the last page, unless Trunin, you would like us to add um, add to that in any way. I don't know, uh, but it's very comprehensive. Uh, and these are the links uh, and the references to all the web resources. So you've got a Ministry of Justice guidance to tax appeals, including the notice of appeal. You've got HMRC guidance on how to appeal against an HMRC decision. Although, again, I have like published posted some stuff about LinkedIn because some of it's a bit, you don't need to be as thorough as HMRC seems to be stating. Um, and also you've got the database of first tier tax tribunal judgments um, because you need to have a very good grounding in legal, legal techni technicalities and case law in order to argue your case. So um, it's been brought to my attention recently of where um, there was a representative um, um, who did, uh, where the judge actually said the skeleton argument added absolutely no value to the case whatsoever. Um, so you need to ensure that the representative or, representative or agent um, really does have a good solid technical understanding that would add value to the case and not take away from it because otherwise what's the point of having someone to represent you? Um, then you've got the um, FTT procedural rules um, which outlines all the, um, you know, the directions and so on, and also, and it does also emphasise that everything, the whole point is to carry out a um, tribunal hearing on a fair uh, and reasonable basis, uh, and it's something that's linked through the human rights because this is one of our human rights to be um, to have access to a fair and just hearing. So um, that the last one, I think we have a last poll that is uh, completely different from our topic. And it's fun as well. <laughs> because it's been quite a solid, uh, a solid tribunal, very technical. I didn't want to do too technical. I just wanted to go through the process. So are you, just a reminder to you, or are you ready for Mother's Day out there? Because you should be coming this Sunday. So if you're not, you better go out and uh, get your presents for your mums and your wives and so on. Um, uh, we're on a 50-50 split right now. <laughs> that was so <laughs> comprehensive. Uh, we, we're being asked if these slides will be available publicly. Um, I, I tend to not share the slides as such uh, going forward, but the... Um, but I can do it on this case because there is a lot of guidance in there that is going to be essential. So I'm happy to do that in this case. And there will also be um, a lie. This will also be uh, the recording will be sent out, won't it, Gary? Yeah, that's right.